Inline check valves are classified as directional control valves because they dictate the direction flow can travel in a portion of the circuit. Because of their sealing capability, many designs are considered to have zero leakage. The simplest check valve allows free flow in one direction and blocks flow from the opposite direction. This style of check valve is used when flow needs to bypass a pressure valve during return flow, as a bypass around a filter when a filter becomes clogged, or to keep flow from entering a portion of a circuit at an undesirable time. Because of slight spool leakage on standard directional control valves, we must add a check valve to the circuit if we need to hydraulically lock a cylinder. This type of check valve is referred to as a pilot-operated check valve. Unlike a simple check valve, reverse flow is required through the valve to retract the cylinder. This is accomplished by allowing pilot pressure to act on a pilot piston, thus opening the check valve and retracting the cylinder. To extend the cylinder, the check valve allows fluid to flow freely in one direction and blocks flow in the opposite direction. Accumulators are devices that store energy in the form of fluid under pressure. Because of their ability to store excess energy and release it when needed, accumulators are useful tools for improving hydraulic efficiency. Industrial hydraulic accumulators are typically classified as hydropneumatic. This type of accumulator applies a force to a liquid by using compressed gas. The two most common types of hydropneumatic accumulators are the bladder type accumulator and the piston accumulator. The name of each type indicates the device separating gas from liquid. A hydropneumatic accumulator has a fluid compartment and a gas compartment with a gas tight element such as a bladder separating the two. The bladder is charged through a gas valve at the top of the accumulator while a poppet valve at the bottom prevents the bladder from extruding into the pressure line. The poppet valve is sized so that the maximum volumetric flow cannot be exceeded. To operate, the bladder is pre-charged with nitrogen to a pressure specified by the manufacturer according to the operating conditions. When the system pressure exceeds the gas pre-charge pressure, the poppet valve opens and hydraulic fluid enters the accumulator. The change in gas volume in the bladder determines the usable volume or useful fluid capacity. Now that our accumulator is charged with stored energy, watch it discharge and use the stored energy to accomplish work. In this, there are two types of pressure switches, the Bordon tube switch and the piston switch, shown here. This pressure switch consists of a micro switch, a spring, a mechanical stop, a push rod, and a piston actuator. External lights are often used to indicate that the switch has been activated. When pressure builds in the system, it enters the device applying force to the piston actuator. This energy is transferred to the mechanical stop, compressing the spring, driving the push rod up, until it activates the micro switch. Pressure switches are used to open or close an electrical circuit when a predetermined pressure has been reached. Bordon tube pressure gauges measure the pressure in a system and display it on a calibrated dial. 
the units of calibration are displayed in PSI, BAR, and PSIA. The board on tube is a coiled metal tube. It is connected to system pressure. Any increase in pressure within the system causes the tube to straighten out. The end of the tube is connected to a mechanical linkage which turns a gear. This gear in turn meshes with a gear driving the pointer needle. Watch now as the tube is pressurized, causing the needle to turn and give the new system pressure. The purpose of a flow meter is to measure flow. It is not bidirectional and acts as a check valve blocking flow in the reverse direction. The main components consist of a metering cone, a magnetic piston, which is held in the no-flow position by a tempered spring. Fluid first enters the device, flowing around the metering cone, putting pressure on the magnetic piston and spring. As flow increases in the system, the magnetic piston begins to compress the spring, indicating the flow rate on the graduated scale. As the number of connections in a hydraulic system increase, so does the possibility of leaky fittings. Hydraulic manifolds drastically reduce the number of external connections required. Manifolds used for modular valve stacking incorporate a common pressure and return port. With individual A and B work ports for each valve station, at each station additional control valving may be added by sandwiching or stacking the valves vertically. This is accomplished without any external connections. Manifolds are specified according to system pressure, total flow, number of workstations, valve size or pattern. Transmitting power from one location to another is a key element in system design and performance. Fluid conductors Describe the different types of conducting lines that carry hydraulic fluid between components. The three principal types of plumbing materials used in hydraulic systems are steel pipes, steel tubing, and flexible hose. A safety factor of 4 to 1 is recommended on the pressure rating of the plumbing material. To determine the working pressure of the conductor, we must take the rated burst pressure and divide by the safety factor of 4. Hydraulic hoses are used in applications where lines must flex or bend. In considering the use of hoses, one must first look at system pressure, pressure pulses, velocity, fluid compatibility, and environmental conditions. Hose construction has been standardized by the Society of Automotive Engineers. As an example, 100R2 or 100R4. This designation describes the cover, construction, pressure rating, and application. Hoses are usually pressure rated with a safety factor of 4 to 1. Different types and amounts of reinforcement give the hose specific pressure ratings. The reinforcement may be a natural or synthetic fiber or metal wire. The reinforcement may be braided or spiral bound. Required hose size depends on the volume and velocity of the fluid flow. Unlike pipe and tubing, hose sizes are designated by ID or inside diameter. Sizes are designated in sixteenths of an inch by using a dash and a number, equivalent to the numerator of the fraction. Example is dash 8 or 8 sixteenths or half inch ID. Hose life is good, but all rubber slowly deteriorates with contact from various substances such as solvents, water, sunlight, heat, etc. Hoses are not as permanent as metal conductors and should be replaced every few years. Proper hose installation is critical. Improper bends, twisting, or lack of proper anchoring may lead to hose failure. Steel pipe is often a preferred conductor from the standard point of performance and cost. However, it is often difficult to assemble because welding is required to give maximum leak protection. It also requires costly flushing to ensure a contaminant-free system at startup. Pipe is specified by its nominal outside diameter but its actual flow capacity is determined by its inside area. For example, schedules 40, 80, and 160 
and double extra have the same outside diameter, OD, and can be threaded by the same pipe die. The difference is the inside diameter, ID, and area. Schedule 40 pipe is standard and has the thinnest wall, with more flow area, but less pressure rating. Tubing is used as a conductor when rigid lines are required. It is often easier to assemble and form, and requires no welding to achieve leak-free connections. As with all types of conductors, certain requirements must be met. The line must be large enough to carry the required flow, and strong enough to withstand internal pressures. Tubing is measured and specified by its wall thickness and OD outside diameter. Pressure ratings are based on tubing grade and wall thickness. One piece of tubing is joined to another tube connector or component with a tube connector and fastening nut. Often the tube is pre-flared to 37 degrees to accept a 37 degree flare connector.